far are we going to get in the material? <coughs> are we planning on getting all the way, or because of that problematic snow week? Are we uh, we'll find out. So this is a definition of continuity right here. Well, really, the official definition doesn't include that last part, but the last part is super useful sometimes. So this is the definition of continuity. So th remember, there's two parts. Not only does your limit have to exist, but your value has to exist also. And so I can't really talk about the two one-sided limits anymore because I just explained there's infinite limits. So the best we can do is just the general limit exists and equals to the value. So that's as good as it gets in higher dimensions. So we stopped <coughs> on this example. And what we're going to do now is pick two paths that converge to 0, 0. And hopefully, one of the paths will give us one value, and the other path will give us a different value. And a value and undefined is completely OK. But you just want to make sure that uh, you get different values out of it. So we could try the two that we did last time. Uh, let's try. So we had alpha 1 t. We did, was alpha 1 the t0 and alpha 2 was 0 t? Yeah. Is that, OK. All right, so try these out. and redo the limits with the alphas as t approaches 0. And I'm probably going to run out of room. Yes, absolutely. So what is the alpha 1 path limit? Zero. Zero. So we got 0 over a small number. It's going to be 0. So that's our alpha 1 path right there. So finish computing your alpha 2 path. We got two different paths, both zero. So we're going to look for a third path. So we're going to have to get a little more creative. I'm not going to erase alpha one or two, so we'll just call our third path alpha three. And if we need a fourth path, it'll be alpha, alpha four. So what is another way to approach? I'll go over here on the right. We got to approach the origin. What's another easy way to approach the origin? So there's no z-axis in this problem. We only got x, y as our inputs. Curve? Along the x-axis from the left or along the y-axis from below? So technically, we did go both ways. So if you look carefully, t approach 0, I did not say positive or negative 0. So we actually, on this one, 
let's see, that approached on the y, that this was the x-axis, and we actually approached on both sides simultaneously. And the other one was the y-axis, and we approached on both sides simultaneously. Because I didn't say t was positive or t was negative. That would have specified one of the two sides. And that was true because the denominator has both uh, squared terms? Both squared. Yeah, the function is sort of symmetric in x and y, which is why uh, we got zero both ways. All right, let's do let's do straight line paths before we go for a curve. Straight line paths are a little easier. The easiest one I could think of is approaching on that line. So what would this alpha? We got alpha three now. What could I use for alpha three? Et. So we're going to go t in the x, t in the y, and that would just be the diagonal approach um, on the line with slope 1. When we do the limit, that would give 0 over 0, which would be undefined? Well, let's try it out. No, just talk our way through it. that I'm thinking about this, I think this one actually does exist. Now every new path you find that gives you the same value doesn't tell you a limit exists, but it's stronger indication that it's likely to exist. So we'll do just one more. I don't think this one is, uh, I think this limit actually does exist. So let's not use the straight line. How about a curve? What is a nice easy curve? T squared. So let's do a parabola. So here I'm going to draw a parabola like that. So normally this parabola would be y equals x squared. However, we need to parameterize it. So is it tt squared or t squared t? t squared t. Assuming we plug in t for x. So does it go? T squared T or T T squared? Which of those two? So it goes T T squared. The reason, if you know X, so if X is T, Y would be T squared, like that. So if you just look at the original equation I wrote down, if you know X, you know Y. But the other way is not true. If you know Y, you know x up to a plus minus, but you don't exactly know x. So the function is not one to one, so it does matter which one you assign to t. All right, so we got our alpha three right there. Go ahead, repeat the exact process. Just be careful with your powers. Uh, it'd be alpha four. Yep.
So we're also going to get zero for this limit. And you could apply L'Hopital's rule four times to find that if you want to. Or you can look at powers, and the numerator basically has a higher power of t, so it gets smaller faster than the denominator. We're going to apply with L'Hopital's rule a bunch of times. All right, so I think. out the t squared and the t to the fifth to get t to the third on top. No, I don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can do that. So you can go 4t cubed over 1 plus t squared. And it's probably easy. It's easy to see in that form that is 0, because you're going to have 0 over not zero, 0 over 1. So that's way better than applying L'Hopital's rule. Just do algebra. Better choice. All right, so again, we're going to get 0. So I think this one does exist. I'm not sure how to prove it at the moment. So we'll come back to it. I think it's going to be an epsilon delta proof. So we won't worry about it for now. So we're trying to find the limits where they're all equal zero. Is that what it is? Yeah, but we were unable to. That doesn't, we checked four paths. We'd have to check infinite. We have to check every path, which we cannot do. Okay. So, uh, so we have an inconclusive result. We don't know. How is this helpful? What are we trying to do? Besides it's not. Okay. Not well, everything's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Probably come back and finish it later when I know what I'm doing. When I cheat and read the book. Okay. It's not cheating when you read the book, by the way. That's what you should be doing. It's cheating <coughs> when I read the book. Because it's your first time through the class. You should be reading the book. Because it's not my first time through Calculus 3. Why do we want to take limits of three-dimensional or higher space? Uh... Because not everything occurs in a straight line. Okay. So, for example, physics, if you want to build a bridge that's not like a single line, you're going to have forces and uh, you're going to have to make computations, figure out things match up. So Hopefully, through your physics and engineering classes, you found that vectors are useful, difficult but useful. So use vectors because you can describe physical situations. There's always like, the farther we go, there's usually like more complicated questions, but they get you the answer faster. Like they, it's kind of hard. Usually the further you go, the more complicated things get, but you hopefully are getting better at solving complicated things. So they may seem like they're almost getting easier. But that really means you're getting better, probably. Occasionally, there's really easy sections, and you just you're happy when those happen. All right, let's go do derivatives. Everybody's favorite topic. Let's start out by looking at what a derivative really means before we figure out how to compute them. So we'll do the lowest dimension that's not just one dimension to one dimension. So we'll go two to one. And we're going to think of a surface graph. And the surface graph is going to be all points x, y, comma, f of x, y. So your z coordinate is derived or is a function of your first two coordinates. Such that if you just consider x, y by itself, that's in the domain of f. So this is what we call the surface graph. It's all points x, y that are in the domain and then the z coordinate is picked up, the height is picked up off of some function. So this leads to a surface. I'm just going to draw some generic surface that's not too hard to draw. 
trying to draw this three dimensionally. Like that. Uh, Partial derivatives. So this is supposed to be a surface right here. <coughs> I'll bring that corner back down, kind of like some cloth, sort of, I don't know, parachute shaped, vaguely. It's supposed to be a rectangle, but kind of bending down like a parachute, almost would. All right, so we're going to look at a point on the surface here. So this point, now if you look where it came from, if you project it down, to the ground, to the xy plane, that point on the ground will have coordinates xy, really xy0. That would be the point below on the ground. And then the point on the actual surface up here will be xy, comma, f of xy. That's the actual height of that point. So we take a derivative. Before, what derivative meant was basically a, how things are changing. Now something's a little bit tricky. Things can change in two different axes. So not only on the x-axis, but also on the y-axis now. So there's basically two slopes. There's an x-axis slope and a y-axis slope. So I'm going to draw two curves on here. One of them is going to be uh, parallel with the, I'll draw the parallel to the x-axis first, and I'm going to cut through the point so it's going to look something kind of like that, it's a little too thick. So that's supposed to be parallel to the x-axis. Maybe I should use uh, parallel to the x-z plane, maybe that's a little better way to describe it. So you can't, it's, it's a curve, so it's not parallel to an axis, but it exists on uh, a plane. And then there's one going with the y-axis, and that's going to look something like that right there. Let's go in the other direction, all right? So one of the slopes <coughs> tells you how much is uh, changing along the x-axis, so the x-axis slope will, I'll draw that in green. Whoa, it's way too big. So that's one slope, and the other slope is going to look like that right there. So it's basically telling you at the point, what slope are you working with? So you can basically just have two, uh, two graphs. Yeah, you could think, you kind of, kind of reduce it to a 2D two 2D graphs. Uh, so you have these two vectors, and what we're going to do is think about the plane that these vectors span. That's a word from linear algebra, and the way we're going to think about it, just like we did the right hand rule, take your two fingers, finger one, finger two, you don't really need your thumb this time. So these are the two vectors, they should be 90 degrees or at a right angle. Uh, just think about the plane that's going to sit on top of those. That is what we call the tangent plane right here. So if I drew the tangent plane, I'm going to erase it because it's going to be too crowded, but the tangent plane would look like that right there. So that's what the tangent plane would look like. I think there's going to be too much if I leave it here. I'm trying to draw too many grids at the same time, so I'm going to take it back off, but that's what it looks like. So we no longer have a tangent line. We have the next higher dimension, which is tangent plane. So, kind of like with normal derivatives, how like a tangent line would like barely touch like one spot. This it is now going to be like a plane sitting on that one spot. Sitting on the one spot, yeah. And before you saw tangent lines, especially if you had a function that went uh, kind of back and forth, you could have a tangent right here that also touches the graph at several other points, coincidentally you can have the same situation where this plane, this surface may come back, kind of cross over again and again if it's like extra bumpy or something like that. All right, so there's our tangent plane. How in the world do we compute this thing? Well, first of all, before we decide how to compute it, how do we define planes before? They're both two axes. 
we had an equation. What information did that equation need? So you, you could be created from three points, but what did we really do with those three points? So we got two vectors, took a cross product to get the normal vector, and then took any point and any other point on the plane and basically made sure the dot product was zero. So one way to define a plane is with the normal vector. How would I get the normal vector? I haven't drawn the normal vector. How would I get the normal vector? Cross both the green arrows. Cross the green arrows. That'll give me a vector pointing perpendicular or out or down through the plane, depending on the is order. That why, is that because they're perpendicular to each other? Uh, nope, because a cross product is perpendicular to these that's two. That's so I, these two will be perpendicular. However, they won't necessarily be parallel with the xy plane. I drew it like they're almost parallel with the xy plane. Yeah. That's not true in general. So they're not always, if you just take your fingers, I kind of drew it like they're flat. They could very well be some weird angle. So your normal is not up. Your normal might be some weird diagonal. Normal might even be going, well, in this situation, the way I define the surface, you can't have a vertical edge if you just think about the way it's defined. Because at any xy point, you have to have one z value, the way this surface is defined. So I can't have a surface that wraps back around itself. So this type of surface will never have a vertical side. So we'll never have a z or a y plane? So It'll never have a vertical side because it wouldn't, it would have to have repeated x, y values. Like it would have to have multiple x, y value or an x, y value that has multiple z values with it in order to have vertical edge, which that would not be a function. So there are limitations to this, to this definition of a surface. All right, so let's go ahead and compute this. So like I said, there's two tangents. Let's give them names. So I'm going to call the one that goes on the y-axis. Well, first of all, what's wrong if I just call both of them f prime? Yeah, how do you know which one I'm talking about? So I can't just use prime anymore. It's not good enough. So that's out. So one goes in the x direction, one goes in the y direction. Maybe one should have an x in the notation and the other should have a y in the notation. So x prime and y prime? That's exactly what we're going to do. We'll go fy will tell us the change with the y, and fx will tell us the change with x. So we're writing a subscript x and a subscript y. Oops, that guy's f. X. And that just tells you when you're changing your X coordinate, how does the function change? Or when you're changing your Y coordinate, how does the function change? So write the definition. So this function is F. It's not F prime anymore, but it's F sub X. So that sub X is our derivative notation. Because this function takes two variables, not just x, we have a different notation. So this is delta, the same letter you saw for the boundary operator. And what we're going to do is go all the way back to the definition. So this definition of a limit or a derivative should be familiar. The only trick is what should I add h to? X. I'm just going to add it to x in this case because I only want to know what's the difference when I move x a tiny bit. So I'm not going to move y. Y is fixed. So we got f x plus h comma regular y. So we're basically doing a derivative in just the x and then we'll come back to the derivative in the y. So that's our fx, and fy is the same thing, except we're going to do the plus h to the y coordinate.
No, it should all be the same F. I may have actually changed fonts. No, the only difference here versus what you saw before is the D turned into a delta. And then, and of course, our plus H is a little bit funky. I guess just what I'm asking is, would the first term be like F prime of X in order to be equivalent to the D E X of mm. F X? No, well, so we can't really use prime anymore because you have to be specific about what variable you're priming with respect to, what variable you're differentiating with respect to. Uh, so this that takes the place of the prime, basically. So there's one, there's not one derivative anymore. There's one derivative for each input variable. Okay, so we have uh, fx at some x naught y naught. <coughs> so if I actually plug in specific values, this, I should have been more specific. I'm going to call the point that we're at x naught y naught and then f of x naught y naught So the x derivative at x naught y naught, that would be the slope, it's a little bit weird, but that would be the slope of the green arrow if you thought about it just in two dimensions. So if it was positive, that would mean it's going up as it's coming out, and if it's negative, it's going down as it's coming out of the board. Now remember, right and left only works when your x-axis is oriented from the left to the right. Yeah, from the left to the right. Now we have two orientations. There's one along basically each axis. So there's one in the x and one in the y. So the x-axis is oriented out of the board. So we're going out of the board, that's forward. And if our derivative is negative, we're coming out of the board going downwards. And if it's positive, we're coming out of the board going upwards. So it's always oriented with the axis. It's, uh, going along, same thing in the y direction. So if I'm looking at fy, the one I drew on the board looks like it's pretty close to being flat or horizontal, maybe a tiny bit downwards. So this one is measured when I'm going in the y direction, so that'd be to the right. If it's up to the right, it's positive, down to the right, negative. So increasing, decreasing really is dependent on what axis you're looking down. So it's all relative here. <coughs> So I can write uh, Lx of t, and that will be the line Lx of t. Color, let's get a new color here, the orange. So that orange line right there, that'll be Lx of t. write it as vt plus p naught. Our vector is our derivative, except our derivative was a number. So I have to convert it a little bit into a vector. So the way it converts and I'm gonna call whoa, I'm gonna call this slope M X. F of X or F of Y. It's going to be an mx uh, plus our original p naught point, which we called x naught y naught fx naught y naught. All right, so I just put a zero and a one next to the number, or next to our slope number. So what in the world's going on here? Let's think about what that vector corresponds to up here. So it goes x1, y0, and then z is mx, or is our slope. All right, 
First of all, is this vector going at all in the y direction? No. Nope, that's where the zero comes from. Is this vector coming out of the board? Yes. Yep. So it's coming out of the board, and it's either going up or down. So I just said it's coming out of the board with basically unit speed, and whatever mx is, if it's positive, it's coming out and going up, and if it's negative, it's coming out and going down. So that's why mx you see in the z coordinate. That's the going up, going down part. So that's why it goes zero, uh, 1, 0, slope, x slope. Um, can you explain the t a little bit? Because in two dimensions, our t increases with the x axis, or? So, yeah, the way I wrote it, uh, t equals 0 will be at the point itself. And I think positive t values are going out of the board, and negatives are going back. Would it be like a ripple? T moves out from the origin, or would it be T is coming this way, and yes. then T is going that way? Yeah, because this is a line, not a sphere or a circle. Okay. So positive T values are, well, the way it's drawn, kind of down to the left, and negatives are up to the right. Okay. It's probably better to think of out of the board and into the board, though. Okay. All right, so that is our LX right there. LX, I'll label that. Now let's go with another color, go purple. So now we're doing LY. Here. <laughs> you can just use regular, <laughs> regular colors. <laughs> yeah. That's for the y line, so a line with the y axis. All right, so our other slope, our y slope, I'll just call it my. So it's going to look the same, except our uh, vector is going to be a little different. So I'll fill in the vector in a minute. Everything else stays the same. We're still going through x not y not, fx not y not, so that's not changing. So let's figure out what coefficient should be in front of t, what direction that we should be traveling. Obviously, my is one of the components. So what component should be zero? So we shouldn't have any x. So it better not be going in or out of the board. So that's zero in the x. Now. If we don't think too hard and just follow the form, what does it look like it should be? 1 and y. 1 and y. So if we just follow the pattern, how much z is changing is the slope, and then we need to be going to the right. So that's why 1 is in the y coordinate, meaning go to the right, and then how much we go up is my. And now we'll look back. So I'm definitely going to the right. This particular slope I drew is only a tiny bit down, so it'll just be a tiny bit down as we move to the right. So this will have a very small negative z coordinate to go downward slowly as we go to the right. So any questions on that ly down there? So why is there no lz? Because z is a function of f and x, not. So, so I could draw a third line, but it would basically be the normal. So it wouldn't be very exciting. So it would just be the normal going straight. Uh, I shouldn't say straight up. It'll be perpendicular to the two tangent it's vectors the that we drew. Is it also because like? Yeah, well, yeah, z is not really a function of z, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about that derivative so in terms of x and y. Right? Z is a function of x and y, yeah, it's not a function of z. But the reason that you get a z is because the, if you cross it, you get a, you get a well, you wouldn't call it z because you know. Well, I could cross them, and I'll get some vector that's probably going to look something like that. It would be the normal right there. 
But technically, that's not a cooling decision. That's a fact that the lieutenant could point to now. They can do that. It's very likely. There's a, probably just one point on this on this surface that actually has a direct up normal vector, just by the way it gently curves around. Like most points are not going to point up. They're going to. You find the one point, let's say maybe it's, I don't know, somewhere back there that actually has that vertical vector. All the other points kind of slope away from that one. The further away you go, the more away from the z-axis they're going to be. Does that make sense? Or you could just think of the uh, normal plane is going to look, you know, quite tilted over on the side. Whereas closer to where I drew it, it's going to look more flat. Let's go ahead and compute some of these derivatives. So a normal line, take one across the other, and it comes in the opposite direction. But what do you do with a normal plane? Uh, what's that? When you cross one line into another, you well, get When you a say cross a line, you mean cross one vector with another vector? One, yeah, one vector with another. You get a line going straight up. You get a vector you going straight up. One plane with another plane, but they all have. You get so we did that. Well, you can't cross a line with a line. You cannot cross a plane with a plane. The only thing you can cross is a vector with another vector. So, so if you're talking about the direction of a line cross with another direction of a line, you'll get a third direction that's perpendicular. Okay. But what is a normal plane? Yeah. What is a normal plane? Yeah. If you had two vectors, they live on a plane, and if you cross them, you'll get the normal vector pointing straight up, the normal to the plane that they live on. Okay. Now we did take two planes and intersect them, and that's when we crossed their normals, and that gave us the line of intersection of the planes. Okay. But I wouldn't say that's crossing two planes. It's crossing the normals of two planes. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Geometrically, they're very different. Okay. So there's really no, I don't know how much insight, the only thing geometrically they're related in a complementary way with the dimensions, but that's like a weird way to think about it. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the geometry of how those two things are related. Okay. Know them individually, but don't worry about how they relate. At least not now. Maybe if you major in math your senior year, you start thinking about that question. Okay. Don't think about it now. So we're going to do a computation. I can already tell there's going to be a quotient rule, no matter what derivative I ask you to compute. So the x derivative is going to be a little easier to compute because there's less x variables. So compute the x derivative first. When you do so, y is a constant. If you really need to, you could replace it by pi, but and then swap it back out at the end. But y is a constant. When you take derivative, it acts like a constant. Deri X derivative of y is zero. That's a rule. It's constant. Okay. All derivatives of constants are zeros. Oh no 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 no! But you're telling us that the, the y is a constant. Is that because you're telling us is that like a rule in this section? The partial derivative, so you're taking the x derivative. The x derivative treats y as a constant. The y derivative treats x as a constant. Correct. Yeah, actually, that's, that's one of my they treat the, whatever coordinate is not that coordinate is a constant. So if I had a z variable, it would also be a constant on the x derivative. It's almost like the, uh, I can't remember what rule it was, but we just took out all the, all the variables, not the variables, but the letters out. What rule did I just use on the board? Well, I did a little algebra right here, but you passed the 
I use a constant multiple rule. I actually was going to say that, but that was going to be... It's a little weird. I took a 2y out. It's a little strange. But 2y is constant when it comes to the x derivative. I'm just trying to avoid the quotient rule at all costs. Any questions on that derivative? Now we're going to do the same thing except a y partial derivative. I'm going to use a quotient rule this time. If I rewrite it with the negative power, I'll be using the product rule. So either way, I'm going to have to use product or quotient rule. Last time I was able to avoid both quotient and product rule. So we, we have mainly looked at examples going from R2 into R. If we go Rn into R, you could go D over D. So we're going to write as Xi. So there's I, uh, n partial derivatives. And this is for I equals 1, 2, 3, up to n. So if we're in n dimensions, there's n partial derivatives. And just remember the first coordinate is going to be x1, then x2, etc. to xn. You can't just use xyz if you're not sure how many you're going to have. So we run out of letters really quickly. So there's n partial derivatives. So back in the good old days, back in R1 days, diffable implied continuous. So if you knew your function was differentiable, it has to also be continuous. Unfortunately, uh, with partial derivatives, that's not the case. So you can have a function that has partial derivatives, but is not continuous. So remember, partial derivatives, if we go back for a minute, how many directions did we really measure change? Two. But we just saw from limits, how many ways could I approach that point? Infinite. Infinite. So all we really did was basically two approaches, one that went in one ax along one axis, one that went along another. That is not enough to say, I understand what happens from every single direction. So that's exactly what happens. Well, that's exactly the problem that occurs preventing differentiable, having partial derivatives from your function being continuous. And there's a really easy example we'll look at. So it's sort of true now, but it takes more than just partial derivatives. So 
So easy example function. So first of all, this is a step function. It's probably the first multivariable step function you've seen before. So think about the inputs. When would this function equal zero? I mean, obviously when x, y, x times y is not zero. But think about on the plane, the x, y plane, when is this condition happening? Everywhere, so the origin is definitely happening at the origin, right? The origin, you definitely get zero when you multiply. So the origin is out. What else is out? Both axes are out. So we gotta take out both the axes. Or not take them out, but at the axis, you're gonna have a value of one. Between the axes, you're gonna have zero. So we have one on the axis. I'm just going to write 0, 0, 0, 0, and then the axis are 1. So if you think about this as a surface, it will look kind of like you have uh, one wall and then another wall right here. So that's basically what it's going to look like. All right, let's uh, find the derivative or the slope. How are we going to approach? So we're going to approach 0. That's the interesting point here. Yeah, those are that's just the partial derivatives right there. Yep, if I picked a specific x, y, we could get two numbers that would represent the, uh, <coughs> the two slopes and then plug them into, uh, the, we can cross product at the normal and do other things, yeah. Oh, wait, no, I absolutely do not do that. Okay. All right, <coughs> we're gonna approach zero from exactly two ways. One of them is on the x-axis, one of them is on the y-axis. What slope do I get either way? I have a constant function on the x-axis, it's always one. And I have a constant function always one on the y-axis. So our slope is zero in both directions. So that's fine, derivative exists and it's zero. Derivative exists, both partials exist and they're both zero. So fx at 0, 0 equals 0, fy at 0, 0 equals 0. Both derivatives exist. They're both really nice numbers. Is the function continuous at 0? Nope. You just look in a small neighborhood and you're either 1 or 0. There's a huge jump. There's not a nice continuous transition between 1 and 0. You're either 1 or 0, no matter how small they make that neighborhood. You're going to see zeros and 1s inside of it. So definitely not continuous, this function. There's a big jump. And if you're wondering what am I talking about, I just drew an epsilon neighborhood around 0, 0. I didn't really draw the y values. I discussed what they were. But the y values are zeros out here, and then all the black parts on the axes are 1s. So there's both zeros and 1s inside that neighborhood.